My name is Brianne Donnelly. I uh, run Alumni Relations at Macaulay Honors College. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Special thanks to our awesome panelists. Um, a few housekeeping things. We um, suggest you watch this on speaker view so you can just see the uh, panelists who are talking. Um, Gia is going to be turning off everybody's microphone and video, but if she hasn't or you see that yours is on, if you could, and you're a participant, if you could just turn off your video and um, audio, that should make this run smoother. Um, I wanna welcome everybody. Um, before we get started, I did wanna say that whether you're a Macaulay student, a CUNY student, or you're from an, another school outside CUNY, um, whether you're a student or an alum, um, be sure uh, to be taking advantage of your career services office or your alumni relations office. If you um, are part of a college community, whether a graduate or a current student, you're never alone. There are people that are, it's literally their jobs to help you. So reach out, um, we're here and you have a community to help you. Um, if during the panel, if you have a question, put it in the chat box. And at the end, um, I'll be reading out the questions that come through. So at any point you can put um, a message in the chat and it'll be, um, it'll be set at the end. Um, so with that, I'm gonna um, introduce our awesome moderator who is Samantha Fang. She is a Macaulay at Hunter student. She's a freshman, a statistics major, and um, she's gonna take it from here. So I'm gonna um, hide myself and enjoy the panel. All right, thank you so much, Brianne. So I'm gonna start off by introducing the panelists now. So first up, we have Eamon Coleman. He is a senior partner business development manager at Amazon Web Services, who graduated from Baruch College with a bachelor's of business administration in finance in 2009. Um, next up, we have Ethan Frisch. He graduated in 2008 with a dual degree in conflict studies in education and social change, and is currently the co-founder and co-owner of Burlap and Barrel, uh, which is a successful spice business, and the co-host of a podcast on the Heritage Radio Network called Why Food. Next, we have Andrew Mahabir. He graduated from Baruch College in 2008 with a degree in accounting and is currently a senior manager at Deloitte, where he has worked for the past 11 years. Next, we have Renee Rizzo. She has worked as a special educator at the high school level for nine years, as well as taking on multiple teacher leadership roles. And she graduated with a bachelor's in elementary general education from the College of Staten Island in 2009. And last but not least, we have Brian Schur. He is a physical commodities professional who graduated with a degree in economics and classical studies from Hunter in 2010. He currently manages a tutoring business and a full-time teaching position at Hunter College High School. Um, thank you so much again to all of our panelists for joining us today. I'm just gonna hop straight into the first question now. Um, the first question is, can you quickly share your current position and then can you walk us through what the first couple months post-graduation were like? What were your first steps and how long did it take you to land your first opportunity? So Eamon, you're up first. Sure, yeah, so um, this is Eamon. I'm a senior tech biz dev manager at, at Amazon and um, based here in Seattle now. So, you know, you're asking kind of what, uh, what the first months kind of felt like. And I know that when I was graduating, I think the crisis was well underway. And for me, that, that kind of time period just felt like walking in quicksand. So definitely very stressful time. Um, for me, I think the most important thing that I, you know, did was to reach out to people in my network. And I didn't have the strongest network at that time. I didn't have, you know, a professional network of people that I could, you know, reach out to on LinkedIn or whatever it may be. So for me, it was actually family. And I actually um, sought a kind of mentorship with my uncle. And the kind of post-graduation was, you know, me spending a few weeks trying to figure out what the heck I'm going to do. And then I actually bought a one-way ticket and I went to Europe for a little bit to be with my uncle, get some kind of advice. And I think it was really important to kind of step away from the situation um, to really kind of uh, think seriously about, about what was going on and where, where I fit in in the big picture. Um, and it took time. You know, I think it took me, I was thinking back, I think it took me about six months before I landed something. So really I had that whole summer um, to kind of decompress and think. And then around January of that next year, I actually, uh, I did wind up taking a position at a startup company. 
Um, salary wasn't what I was thinking it would be, uh, but it was really about the experience. And, and what was unique about it was that because I took some time to step back, I actually was able to think about things differently. And, um, you know, I took a position at a startup company in Dublin, which gave me some international experience. And, you know, that's six months. It actually helped me figure out that I could pivot. So while I wound up majoring in finance, I wound up doing something quite different. And it was more in line with what I'm passionate about, which is technology. I mean, um, yeah, I think that's kind of my situation. The first couple of weeks and months were very stressful. Um, then you just roll with it and, uh, you know, just know that, you know, if you, if you can step back from the situation and, and kind of evaluate the landscape, you'll find something. So. All right. Thank you. Um, Ethan, same question. Yeah, so my name is Ethan Frisch. I'm the co-founder of a company called Burlap and Barrel. We're a public benefit corporation, spice company, setting farmers up to export their own crops, uh, which we import and sell online and supply to restaurants. Um, I graduated in 2008, and uh, that was I, I uh, life was good for 10 minutes before the financial crisis hit. Uh, I had a job lined up actually with a political organization that I'd been interning with while I was still in college, the Howard Gilman Foundation. Um, so I worked for them for a few months, but uh, I think it was by October of 2009, I graduated obviously June or May of 20, 2008. Um, by the following year, they had lost their endowment, uh, a good chunk of their endowment, and had laid off my entire department. Um, so I worked there for just over a year and then uh, hadn't uh, had didn't have a job anymore so i wound up working in a restaurant kitchen which i mean we'll talk about this later in the in the discussion but that put me on a path that i don't think i ever would have been on um and which has very directly led me to where i am today all right thank you uh andrew same question sure so i'll take i guess maybe the last part of your question about landing your first opportunity because i think um very similar to um you know to ethan i graduated in 08 so it kind of it was really great for about you know a month or two before things started really going awry. But I'll maybe take the kind of going about landing the first opportunity because uh, I think it's important for the students, especially for our Macaulay Honors College students, that this is kind of I guess my big plug for the Honors College is that me actually even just getting a position, which I thankfully was able to ride through the um, the 2008 crisis and still be at the same place for I guess now 11 years. But it really started you know just going back to my sophomore year. Um, you know, through the Honors College, I was able to get lined up with an internship at the New York Life, Insur New York Life Insurance Company in their internal audit department. And that really allowed me to kind of get that first major item on my resume. And then in my junior year, I was able to study abroad. Um, through Brooklyn College, I was able to do the winter abroad program that I think is still running today um, and was able to take advantage of that using my stipend money and that added that to my resume. And then kind of those kind of experiences combined ultimately led me to when I was interviewing for internships during my time at uh, my junior year, uh, you know, one of my big, my interview at Deloitte, um, I had two interviews. One was with a partner, with a senior manager and went okay. And the other was a partner who ultimately went on to do a lot of really cool things at, at the firm. But he, we started with small talk about my, my study abroad. And then we, you know, kind of, you know, we were about seven minutes into the conversation. And then he was like, I think I've heard enough. Um, I'm going to turn the interview over to you and I'd like you to ask some questions. So this was being a 20 year old having to talk to a pretty senior partner and kind of navigate through an interview. And thankfully through the experience I had through Macaulay, I was able to you know, navigate the interview. An hour later, I found out that I had an internship. This was February, 2007, and they haven't been able to kick me out since. So it's been about 13 years all in. Um, and that's kind of been my experience. So that was, you know, through what I was able to do through the Honors College, it kind of helped situate me to get into a, a good, good position. And I'll talk about it a little bit later about navigating the time in 2008, 2009. But ultimately, I was able to stick around and, you know, be able to be here for, again, for almost 13 years, including my internship. All right. Thank you. Uh, Renee, same question. So um, I graduated in 2009, and as you said, I was an elementary ed general education major. Um, at the time I graduated, there was a hiring freeze um, in general ed. Um, so I decided to revisit like my options, and I found the College of Staten Island um, Education Department, 
very helpful in the suggestions that they made to us. Um, they suggested that many of us, instead of going part-time for our master's degree, because we had this opportunity almost um, to go full-time. So I went full-time uh, for my master's degree in special education. I decided to specialize to make myself more marketable and more likely to get a job. Um, that was my original intention. Um, and since then, I've been in the field of special ed for nine years, and I couldn't even see myself as a general ed teacher. So it started out with going through um, for the master's program full time. I started subbing, substitute teaching simultaneously for a year, and then I got a job. So, you know, similar to what uh, I think it was Eamon who said, like, realize he could pivot. That's what you, you wind up doing just deal with the circumstances however you can. So. Mm -hmm. All right, and last but not least, Brian, same question. Uh, hey, um, so I was, I was a little bit more towards the, the tail end, but um, so, so as people said, it, the financial crisis kind of got worse in 2009 and they still weren't really hiring too much in, in 2010, um, uh, even though things were starting to unfreeze a little bit. It was, it was not a, it was, it was not a market for the people who were looking, but uh, I think people have already said uh, personal network and, and that's going to, you're not going to have business contacts. I think it was Eamon who said that. So that looks like family. For me, another avenue is I had been on the wrestling team at Hunter and you can, you can totally reach out to alumni cold. I found out you can't reach out to someone you've never met before and say, Hey, give me a job. But you can say people are really, really open to, Hey, you know, I'm graduating. There's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, I need some advice. Would you Would you like to have a coffee? I guess today the version of that would be chat on Zoom. But um, but the same thing applies. And I, I did a lot of that. And actually, my I had an internship at Morgan Stanley um, that I was juggling my senior year along with classes and stuff. And uh, you know that was through through a wrestling alumni. You know, and I got a lot of I got a lot of meetings like that you know and and my other advice is just just go on any meeting or your interview i went on even if even if i didn't really think i was interested in the field like the job i ended up w in was physical commodities trading and i didn't even know that was a niche that existed and and it's this huge business that all of the major investment banks were in and a lot of the financial services companies were in that i i wasn't even it wasn't even on my radar and that was I took a meeting with a guy who had been like CFO of a, of a pool. They made like supplies for pools, you know? And then he introduced me to this guy who was, you know, a managing director on this commodities desk. And, and you know, that turned into a job. And, and, and you'll get a lot of bad, like, I went on some interview with some uh, investment advisors who turned, it turned out to be like a boiler room, really is what it was. And uh, I'm sitting in the guy's office and he's like telling me like, you need to be a little greedy for this job and stuff. And then he tells me like, you need to tell me right now if you want this job or not, you know? And I, I was like, no, I don't want this job at all. But it was a good experience because, you know, I learned, I learned how to say no. I learned what like a not legitimate financial services company looks at. And I have a funny story to tell for the rest of my life. So I just went on a lot of stuff and took the attitude that I was gonna learn from everybody and uh, that I didn't know much about anything, which was definitely the case. Okay. All right, thank you. My next question is, what would you say is your biggest takeaway from your experiences navigating the 2008 financial crisis? And what advice would you give your younger self and to current graduates who will be going through something similar? So Eamon, you're up first. Yeah, I think um, the biggest one for me was just, right, the path isn't set in stone. Renee said something great. It was like, think of it as, a, as an opportunity in a way, right? Because in many, in many ways, you're kind of stuck studying, not stuck, but you've spent the last four years really focused on your studies. And the truth is, you're still young. Um, so when you get out, it's an actual opportunity to kind of see the forest from the trees. You know, six months ago, you might have said your dream job was to go work at Airbnb. They may not even survive the next six months to a year. So think about how the world changes after this, because it is a completely unique event and things are going to be different going forward. So 
you actually have an opportunity to take some time to step back and kind of, you know, look at the, the situation. So certainly, you know, it doesn't, doesn't feel like an opportunity, but in, in a way it is. So take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. uh, Ethan, same question. Yeah. Uh, so I've been laid off like five or six times over the course of my career. The, the foundation laid me off. I worked for a restaurant that closed. I worked for a startup that closed. I worked for a catering company that closed. I mean, this kind of thing is going to happen to you almost regardless of when you graduate, but particularly graduating in the middle of a financial crisis. Um, so some of it is just finding the resilience in yourself to roll with it and pivot as other people have mentioned. Um, but the other thing, I guess my biggest takeaway was, was how lucky I was to be graduating from Macaulay. I, I've seen all of my friends who graduated from schools where they actually had to spend money to attend those schools. Uh, I've just seen them struggle for the last, especially in the years right after we graduated, but even you know, 10 to 15 years after graduation, people are still paying off student debt. People are still struggling with, with uh, the, the, both the financial burden, but also just the emotional and intellectual burden of carrying that debt with them. And, and it's definitely limited their career choices. It's put them in a position of saying, can I do what I love or can I do what pays me enough to, to pay off my student loans? Um, and luckily, thankfully, that was never a, a compromise that I had to make and, and hopefully not a compromise that any of you will have to make either because you're graduating without that enormous burden on your shoulders. It gives you so much more freedom to make the pivots, to, to experiment, to pursue things that you're interested in that may not pay very well, but, but you will love and you'll learn a lot doing. Yeah. Uh, Andrew, same question. Yeah, I mean, just to, I think we're all, all the alumni are kind of nodding their heads here because I think we were all really thankful to not have to worry about that debt. And I, I, I kind of actually posed the, some of these questions out to some friends on LinkedIn just to kind of see what they thought. So a lot of my colleagues also graduated at the same time and definitely the advice I got was around just being able to take advantage of the opportunities that we don't have the enormous amount of debt over our heads. And, you know, whether that be, you know, needing, if, you know, if your circumstances change and let's say you had an internship or a full-time offer that is either now going to be altered or maybe just evaporate altogether. I mean, there's some ways to be flexible and resourceful. I think, you know, Eamon mentioned it. I think everyone here has mentioned it, but just the ability to continue to be flexible and resourceful. Uh, but, Again, uh, whether it be maybe even just taking an unpaid internship, you know, we have the flexibility again through the, you know, not having that student debt, you know, getting that extra thing on your resume, or maybe it's that volunteer opportunity. And maybe like, like Eamon said, he took a pivot. It was able to go from finance to doing something else. This could be your opportunity. You know, you spent four years, you know, thinking about graduating and majoring in something, thinking that that's where you wanted to be, but that may not necessarily have been where your heart is this could be an opportunity to just take that and to, to make that pivot because you don't necessarily have that, that burden. And then I think the other thing I'd like to just say is that, you know, there is, and again, Ethan kind of mentioned this, there's a little bit of a mental health thing here. I mean, like I, I kind of saw the full brunt of 2008 and saw 50% of my start class, you know, over 200 people get laid off. You know, we, we graduated at a time where, you know, there was, you know, we really didn't have smartphones the way we had smartphones today. So basically you'd come into the office, open up your laptop and like essentially there was potentially an email in your inbox that said, Hey, you need to report to this partner. And that was basically your email that you were getting let go. So there was legitimately like a two month, you know, time frame where you just didn't want to open up your inbox and didn't want to open up your email. Um, but what I learned out of that was that, you know, us being the most junior folks at the firm, you know, there really wasn't much that we could do. And it was a lot of it was out of our hands. So you really can't blame yourself in any of this. It's just that there's circumstances that are happening way out of your control. So, you know, you can't let, you can't have that weigh you down too much and just, again, use it as an opportunity to pivot and kind of, you know, to explore and to do something else. Great, thank you. Renee, same question. Um, yeah, so Andrew spoke a lot about flexibility and um, just, being able to maneuver through things um, that you didn't expect to have to maneuver th through, I think is um, a big life lesson just for work things, for school things, and even for personal things, because we all go through things in life. Um, so I think the biggest takeaway is to be completely flexible. Like I found out that special education was for me, but had it not been for me, it would have at least been a stepping stone and it would have been something that I can learn from. 
and then move on when the opportunities did come back. Um, that's another lesson that the pendulum in life kind of always swings back and forth. Um, although things seem negative and dire now, it will not be that way forever. And that's just the ebb and flow of life in general. Um, we're definitely lucky to have graduated from Macaulay where we don't have a lot of student debt um, because that's a very real problem. Um, also, something that I learned is kind of sometimes it's okay to get emotional about a situation because it it is a lot to face. Um, but once you vent or get through the emotions of it, sort of back away and look at strategy. Like, okay, what are my actual options and what is the most likely option to yield positive results for me? So um, I guess don't get mired in the emotions of a situation, although it's normal to have emotions about the situation, negative or whatever, um, but don't get stuck there. Um, have your feelings and then move on and just see what your options are. All right, Brian, same question. Yeah, I mean, it's similar to what other people have said. I think, I think the point is you, you just, you don't, you never know what's going to happen. Like the 2008 financial crisis, there, there were like three guys who saw that coming. You know what I mean? They wrote a book about them and made a movie about them because that's how few people really saw any of that coming. I get blindsided everybody and, and this whole thing too. And so, so anything you do and no matter how well laid your plans are, I mean, I've experienced it. I, I was part of a, a startup a trading company. I moved to Dubai and um, we had a great investor backing and we, we, we had this really exciting opportunity and somebody on another desk makes one trade and the whole thing is like gone in an instant, you know, uh, one bad trade from some guy on a, on a different desk. And, and so, you know, you really, you don't know what's going to happen. And, and that's like, that's just the way it is. And, but, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing because like other people were saying, you know, you don't, you don't even know what opportunity is the best for you. Or at least my experience is I haven't always known, like, I really thought that I wanted to be a trader. And for, for a little bit of time, I was, I was really happy doing it. But, but what I actually found is after six or seven years in that business is, is like, I was, I was really unhappy with it and I was done with it, you know? And, um, you know, looking back, I was unhappy with it probably for years before that business, you know, blew up. And uh, so if that at all had never happened, I probably would have never made a career change. And, and now, you know, now I'm a teacher. I work at Hunter College High School and, and I absolutely love it, you know. And uh, I go into work and I, I just have like a, a ton of joy um, with everything that I do. And, and so like, you know, just like I never could have plan my first career, I never could have planned my second career. And, and for some people, your career will work out like linearly and you will be happy. Obviously, there's people here that that's happened to and that's the case, but like, it doesn't have to be linear to be good, you know? So, I don't know, that's, that's been my experience at least, so. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Um, my next question is, can you describe how you're feeling at the time of graduation? Did you feel prepared, nervous, lost? Kind of walk us through what was on your mind at the time. Um, Eamon, you're up first. Yeah, um, I definitely, I would say like dazed and confused. Um, you know, I don't want to say I felt scared or truly unprepared. I do think that a lot of the experiences I had, again, just, just going to school in New York City, right, is one thing. Like, it's just something about, you know, it, it, it toughens you and it, it makes you resilient. Um, so I don't feel like I was entirely unprepared. Um, you know, I also had a study abroad experience, which kind of opened my eyes up to, you know, just rolling with punches and just kind of, um, go, you know, being up for an adventure. So I looked at it as an kind of, opportunity to uh, just take risks and do things a little bit differently because uh, I didn't really have a choice. So um, yeah, I was definitely worried at the, at the onset of graduation, but that, that quickly kind of faded away and I just looked for ways to take advantage of it. Um, yeah, it was definitely emotional. So I, I would just kind of say like, again, you don't go it alone. I think Brian mentioned something like just 
feel free to reach out to people, especially alumni, you know, myself included, like you would be surprised that people that you don't know, but you just have the slightest connection to will be, you know, it, th these types of times bring out the best in people. So, you know, I would say feel free about reaching out cold to people and just saying, Hey, cup of coffee or a quick call, like pick up the phone. So people are definitely out there for you. One thing I wish I had done differently is I did, for example, Bram brought it up is the career guidance center. I just kind of, I did go it alone for the most part. So if I could go back in time, I would have kind of reached out more, leveraged some of the resources at the school. But um, yeah, I wasn't entirely unprepared for it and just go into it with an open mind. A lot of the companies I've been at failed or, startup companies and, and it's just stepping stones as someone mentioned like you'll you'll find your way so uh ethan same question yeah i mean in my case graduation was easy it was 2008 so nothing had changed yet i had a job lined up with a great organization that i'd already been interning for for the the semester previous or two semesters previous um I was getting paid a, a good salary. I was I was on top of the world, and then it all ended. And that's the way things go. They they're fun, and you get what you can out of them while they're happening, and then they end, and and you move on to the next thing. And uh, taking ownership over those moves, making decisions about what you want to do, how you want to be spending your time. Um, I I wound up working in a restaurant kitchen. I had no uh, professional experience in kitchens. I didn't go to culinary school, but. I got laid off. I needed a job. I'd always loved to cook. And just through some uh, happy timing and coincidence, uh, I got an interview at a restaurant that needed people desperately the day that I walked in. Um, and then that then led me to, I, I, start, I had my own ice cream company for a little while, a political and activist ice cream company. I, I went to grad school for international development. I lived in Afghanistan for a long time. I worked for Doctors Without Borders in the Middle East. All of these, these pivots that I've made were were decisions that I was able to make about things that I was interested in, places I wanted to go, jobs that I wanted to pursue that I did for as long as they were interesting and useful, and then moved on to the next thing. Um, yeah, I guess the point I'm trying to make is is find find your way of taking ownership over those over those shifts, over those steps, even when it looks like you're you're powerless, or even when it feels like somebody else is making decisions for you, which often being laid off or not being able to get a job that's how it feels i mean like andrew said i i got an email seven o'clock in the morning saying you're done we're closing down the whole department that's it um and those moments it feels like you're not in control of your career it feels like you're not in control of your life and that can be a really disconcerting feeling but to find ways to to take ownership over the next step and make decisions about what you want to be doing is really really important uh, andrew same question sure so um so I guess Ethan and I were in that same class. So I guess we, again, we were riding really high coming out of 2008. You know, it's, it was a great summer for me, particularly at Deloitte. Like I had two weeks of new hire training. I got a chance to know like 200 of my, you know, colleagues. For those that don't know, Deloitte is a, you know, massive global uh, accounting firm. We do, you know, accounting tax, but then essentially can pro problem solve anything under the sun. So, I mean, we've got something like 310,000 people globally about 100,000 people in the United States. So it's just an enormous organization. So my starting class was huge. And I got a chance to really meet a lot of great people from all over the country. And it was it was amazing. It was probably like two of the best weeks of my life. I'm having went to Baruch and you know commuted to school. This is what I thought the first two weeks of college was supposed to be like being in a dorm, being in a hotel, hanging out with all of my colleagues. We had no work after work. It was great. But then quickly that shifted. And what was interesting for me is that, I mean, I worked in Midtown Manhattan. And we were two blocks away from the old Lehman Brothers building, now Barclays Capital. So literally going to work every day and going to lunch every day, you know, we, we started seeing like the, you know, the news trucks, the CNBC trucks, the MSNBC trucks outside of their offices every day. And it slowly started creeping in that there was something that was going to change uh, and something that we didn't really have any, you know, any idea what was coming. So I guess if there's one there's really no benefit anybody can say about the current times, but I guess there's one benefit um, in thinking about the job market is that there, you know, organizations and, you know, for those that are on the line have a little bit more flexibility or ability to plan. I think uh, what a lot of folks have talked about was the ability to make pivots and to move. Unfortunately, when it happened last time, and it was September, 2008, everybody is starting new jobs and you're really not in a great place. So you, you've made all of your plans and, you know, 
basically see it fall apart. I, I think, again, the only upside to the timing of all this is that hopefully, you know, through, you know, through your networks and through other things can have the ability to pivot and make moves. So while I kind of rode that roller coaster, I think we're all riding that roller coaster. I'd say the, at least the one against silver lining here is that I think there's some more time for, for you all as students to be able to plan as you want to navigate what's next. Uh, Renee, same question. Um, yeah, so the emotional aspects of it, I would say that when I graduated in 2009, I was of course nervous mm -hmm. and intimidated by the whole prospect of like having to kind of redesign my life um, based on the circumstances. Um, but I was able to turn it around pretty quickly emotionally and like put things in perspective. Um, I actually, in my personal life, uh, my dad was actually battling stage four colon cancer at the same time that I graduated. Um, and I feel like seeing him, not to sound too overly spiritual if that's not your thing, but like seeing him go through that experience um, and seeing how he just like dealt with things day after day and did not complain. It was very humbling for me um, to see that life kind of hands you things sometimes that are not fair, but um, you have to learn how to deal with them and learn how to deal with them um, the most positive way possible. Um, so it's not really helpful to get mired down in those emotions. Um, uh, there are more important things in life than getting exactly what you want exactly the way that you want it. Um, and that's not to minimize or all of your goals and your dreams and um, everything that you worked hard for. But that's just to say that um, in the bigger picture, uh, there are more important things than having life look exactly the way that you planned it. So um, being able to be honest about what your feelings are, but then putting things in, into perspective. And especially now, I think that's a good lesson um, because it is a health crisis. So having your health, having your family first is like the most important thing. And then everything else can be navigated. You just have to figure out how. So there, nothing is impossible and nothing is forever as long as you have your health um, and people around you who care about you and support you. All right, and Ethan, same question. Oh, Brian, sorry about that. Same question. Um, yeah, I, 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 really, I really agree. Um, I, you know, I'll tell you what, like in, in that vein, um, the worst year of my life by far is also the year I made the most money. <laughs> I was working at uh, BTG Pactual, which is the largest investment bank in Latin America. And I was a commodities trader and I had helped start the physical uh, base metals desk. And um, I was doing really, really well as far as, you know, my career and business went. Um, but I was, I was on the road like 70% of the time. Um, I had ruined a really important relationship to me. <laughs> wasn't spending any time with my family. Like it was, it was an absolute catastrophe. And that's what I thought I wanted was to be like one of the guys, like my boss referred to me as one of our rising stars, you know what I mean? In a meeting with the, some of the partners at BTG. And, but I actually inside my, my life was, you know, falling apart. So you don't really know what you want. I thought that's what I wanted and I was miserable. So, you know, I think that's, that's first of all. And, um, you know, for me personally, you know, how I was in when I was graduating. I think the biggest driver for me back then, and I only realized this in retrospect, was like prestige, maybe. Like I was so concerned with what other people would think of the type of job that I would get or, or something like that, you know? And, um, but unfortunately, when I look back on my life, especially around that age, is that, that colored all my decisions, you know, that colored, um, you know, the jobs I took and the things I said and the people I hung out with. And, um, you know, that's just, that is not a recipe for happiness and peace of mind. And, um, and it's not a recipe for long-term success either. And actually one of the things that, one of the benefits of teaching, one of the things I love that I've learned is that every day I have 131 people 
who couldn't be more convinced that I am a loser and like I'm uncool and they're, they're convinced and nothing I can do will ever change their mind on that. And so I am reminded on a daily basis that I'm uncool. And I can tell you what, it's never felt so good to be uncool and unimportant. I, it's just absolutely terrific. So it's my experience. All right, now I'm going to move on to the individual questions now. So Eamon, my question for you is, how did you go about landing your job at Amazon? And what do you like most about your work? Yeah, thanks. Um, so I think it's like eight years ago, uh, I actually made, I, I was actually living abroad. Um, I had done a one-way trip and took a year off in between startup companies, taught English. And uh, eventually I was like, it came down to making another decision. I think it was Ethan is saying, you know, there, there's times in your life where you get to sit back um, and kind of figure out where you want to go next. Um, so I actually made a conscious decision to move to Seattle. Um, I had an opportunity through my network to come and work at a startup, very risky, um, kind of early stage company. There was like 10 of us. But what it did, I kind of got into, the reason I made the choice was because I had done some work in and around like cloud and that area of technology after I graduated. So I decided to move to Seattle because Amazon is kind of the, you know, the, uh, the headquarters for cloud. And so I, I moved out here about eight years ago and I was just kind of slowly orbiting Amazon during this time where I was working at tech companies that were in the space and then, you know, I spent four years actually at a company where I was managing the AWS relationship, the Amazon relationship at this other company. So I was just kind of in orbit. And um, I always knew I kind of wanted, I, I did want to work at Amazon. There's certain things around their culture and the challenges that they're solving that I really liked. Um, so I would say, you know, what I, what I did, I started to kind of get, you know, build my network of folks that worked there. Um, you know, I, I really went after those opportunities where I could work with that company, knowing that I would want to wind up there. And, um, I think that was kind of the, yeah, how I landed that job. And, and the key thing is that, you know, what I wish I would have done earlier in my career is I, I was never great at, uh, like my five-year plan took eight years or nine years. You know, I was never great at building, what's your three-year plan? Where do you see yourself in five? But what I've started to do nowadays is I will actively, maybe once a year or if I change roles, I'll look at my resume and I'll rewrite it. But what I do is I, I think of what I want to put on my resume for next year. Like I'll just pick a bullet point and I'll say, I want this on my resume next year. And then I'll kind of work towards that. So it's just kind of something I wish I would have done earlier is be a little bit more decisive around what I want and the, the career moves I want to make. Um, because it, it really is possible if you, if you have a strategy and a plan on how to do it, you can really go and execute it. Right. I mean, sometimes it, it feels like, you know, there, there's going to be a lot of different kind of ways to get there, but if you want it, you can go after it. So, um, you just have to build a strategy around it. Mm -hmm. Um, Ethan, my question for you is how have you been able to navigate all your various career transitions and find a career that helps you combine so many different interests, for example, entrepreneurship and activism? Yeah, I think, um, I think it's easy now to look back on the last 12 years and a whole series of career transitions as having some overarching theme or, or like it's, it's easy to pretend that I knew what I was doing at any point in this process. And I promise you, I had no idea what I was doing. And the fact that I have found something that I love, that pays me a decent salary, that gives me the flexibility I want, that lets me travel the world and meet farmers growing the best cinnamon I've ever tasted. The fact that I have wound up here is, um, is a, feels like a miracle most of the time. Um, the, every, every career transition I made, whether it was a, a choice to leave a company or I was laid off or fired or the company closed or whatever it was, uh, I don't think I was ever fired for anything I did. I might have been fired. Anyway, whatever. Um, the, those decisions, whether I made them myself or not, didn't feel like they were part of a bigger picture until I got to a place where I, I, I realized what all of those individual experiences had contributed to what I do now. So, um, you know, uh, working in a restaurant, I, I learned about food. I learned about cooking. I learned about ingredients. Uh, working for Doctors Without Borders, I was doing logistics for a maternity hospital. Uh, we were running on the Jordanian-Syrian border, 
I learned a lot about logistics. I learned how to move things around. I learned how to manage a warehouse. Um, so now I have a, a company where we work with farmers, uh, a skill that I learned while I was working in Afghanistan for a big NGO. We manage logistics of moving shipments around the world, a skill that I learned at Doctors Without Borders. I do a lot of work with chefs and restaurants based on a set of skills that I learned when I was working in restaurant kitchens myself. But at no point in that process would I have been able to tell you this is what I was working towards. It didn't come together until, until it all came together. Um, Andrew, my question for you is how did you go about landing your first role at Deloitte after college and what are your tips for continuing to grow professionally after being at the same company for over a decade? Sure. So I, I kind of alluded to kind of how I landed my first role at Deloitte internship kind of, I guess of the group here, I think I've had the most linear path um, to kind of where I am today. But what's interesting about that though is that um, what's been great about being at Deloitte is that it's the organization helped form a lot of my professional growth just because the organization, uh, like a lot of your professional services companies, your big four accounting firms, they're kind of a pay for performance kind of organization. In order to kind of make it through and up, you kind of have to learn how to do well what you're doing to take the next job. So for example, when you start in a lot, in a lot of, uh, at least for me, this is how it was. When I started, I had to be very technical and a lot of the projects I, I worked on required me to be heavy analytics. So kind of like what uh, Ethan was just mentioning, I feel like he's, I, I should have come after, or we should have had spaced this out a little bit. Um, you know, every new job or every new role I took required me to learn a new set of skills. So I started having to be very Oh no, Andrew, I think you're having uh, some trouble with your connection. Yeah, so let's move on to the next person, Samantha, because I think Andrew, we might've lost him. Okay. Um, so Renee, my question for you is, looking back, do you think getting your master's in special education was the right choice? And can you elaborate on how the education industry was impacted and the hiring freeze in general education at the time? So um, I definitely, for me personally, think special ed was the right move for me. Um, I was a substitute teacher in special education for a year and I got hired at a school that I had substitute taught at, um, for most of my experience. Um, it's a district 75 high school in Brooklyn. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar, district 75 is an entirely special needs district, um, throughout the five boroughs of New York city. Um, I personally teach um, students with autism, intellectual disabilities, and multiple disabilities. Um, I found it to be a very humbling experience, um, and it's also taught me a lot about um, being happy with progress um, as opposed to perfection. Um, it has also like made me an advocate uh, for people with special needs, um, for respect for people with um, differing abilities. Um, I was uh, somewhat of a natural in the classroom just because I am um, someone who always wants to excel. Um, so since in my nine years I've become a teacher leader, I was a model teacher, um, now I'm a peer collaborative teacher, so I also give professional developments to other teachers within my building. Uh, I facilitate a uh, Get Ready to Learn Yoga program in my building. Um, I've also gotten my advanced certificate in school building leadership and school district leadership, which opens me up to the possibility of taking on an assistant principalship or a principalship or um, some leadership role at the district level. Um, so I don't know necessarily that I want to do that, but my options are open to me. And if I did move up, I would definitely want to move up within special education and continue to be an advocate for our students who, in my opinion, need the most. Um, I honestly cannot speak towards like what happened with general ed. Like after I didn't go that route, I do know friends that it took them many, many years to secure a position because they did not want to specialize. Um, but I don't know that that, that, excuse me, that that was everyone's experience. Um, so I can't speak to that really because I stopped pursuing that once I um, found that my calling really was special ed. Um, so I could not be any happier. And just, um, 
it's you great you make great personal connections in special education like for example we've been doing remote learning for seven weeks and today one of my students was able to get on with us for the first time and the smile on his face just seeing like these people who are like family to him who he became so accustomed to being with every day and then to be away from us for seven weeks there's nothing like that there's nothing like the bond that you make with those kids so i couldn't be happier with anything that i've done thank you um andrew i think you're back now your connection a little bit cut off before but you can continue where you left off no worries um yeah i was wondering why nobody was moving there for a while um <laughs> But uh, I, I think the big thing I was just ultimately going to get at is that uh, as I progressed in my Deloitte career in order to get to the next level, basically uh, a traditional career at a, a public accounting firm is you start as a consultant, get promoted to a senior consultant, manager, senior manager, and maybe a partner. That's kind of how the, the road goes. But in order to get to each of those levels, you kind of have to master what you needed to do at each level, have a, you know, then train others to do it, because that's kind of how the organization works so that you have a replacement for your current job, and then so you can take the next job. And so as I went through my career, it was kind of looking, as I wanted to figure out what was next, I kind of looked to the people that were more senior to me. And I would say that to see how they were successful at their level. All right, thank you. Um, and lastly, for Brian, my question for you is, have you been able to navigate the various career transitions that have allowed you to travel around the world for work? And what have you learned from these experiences? And after listening to you describe um, your current experiences, I'm also wondering how you found your passion for teaching. Okay, um, so what's allowed me to do the transitions? Um, besides, as kind of has been alluded to, dumb luck and no other options. Um, <laughs> I would say, I would say the number one thing that allows you to, to make transitions and, and take risks, it's already been said, but it can't be overemphasized. It's just, it's not only no debt in, um, no college debt, but I have a friend. So when I started my tutoring business, people have already said this, but you got to look for mentors about everything. And, and I, I got it. One of my friends is, is an accountant and he does a lot of, um, medium sized private businesses and. And he was giving me some advice. And in the course of talking, we started talking about like how many people he knows, like couples who between the two of them make $500,000, $600,000 a year and live paycheck to paycheck, you know? And when you live like that, you can't take any risks or make any changes. So I would say, you know, you're, you're, uh, I'm a math teacher, so your, your income can be a, a wave function, you know? And your, but your expenses should be like a linear function down here at the bottom. And, and that way, you know, everything in, everything that gets clipped by the wave is, is savings and, and you never get hurt too bad. And, and um, I, I really think no debt at all. It's, you know, uh, probably how you take risks. But um, so, and then I think the other part of your question was, uh, what have I learned from these experiences? Well, that, that's like, you know, Ethan kind of got into that a little bit. That, that's like an hour talk and, and you never know what you're going to use later. You know, I can... I mean, the stuff that I learned from the trading, I'll tell you what I really learned from the trading. Um, two things. One, I remember, I remember to this day, I was, so the CFO at I, um, INTLFC Stone Physical Commodities Unit was this guy, Steve Springer. And he was a grumpy old Jewish guy from the Upper East Side. And he was one of my mentors. And I, I love this guy. And uh, <laughs> we, were, we were going... We we're going to meet this kid, uh, Jason Paver uh, at Deutsche Bank, and we were trying to get this line to do physical commodity repos. And I think we were borrowing money at like 3%. And so I was asking Steve, I said, what are we going to ask this guy for, you know, in terms of the rate for these repos? And he said 175 basis points, which is like half of what we were currently borrowing at. I was like, Steve, I mean, like, I thought it'd be a home run if we could get 2.5%, you know what I mean? And I'm like, you're really going to ask him for, and, and he said, uh, it was a little crude, but he said, Brian, if you don't ask, you don't get laid. And I, I like, I was like, whoa, you know, and uh, that <laughs> I've never forgotten that. And, uh, and I think he said it that way so that I'd remember it forever. And, uh, and, and I did remember it forever. And um, so that's one thing I learned in trading. One of the, one of the benefits of trading is that you, 
you have to go out there and ask for the things that you want and you got to go pursue them. And uh, the other thing I learned is I just met so many people who like, like everybody's been saying, they develop careers and things you never would have expected. I did a ton of business with these two guys, uh, Alejandro and Isak, in, uh, who were recycled metals magnates in the Mexico City area. And I used to spend you know, a week at a time with these guys, hanging out, staying in their house, and, and we did a ton of business with them. And uh, they started out, the two of them, with like a bicycle with like a trailer in the back of it when they were like 14 years old collecting scrap metal and they literally built an empire like a hundred million dollar empire out of junk they had like 35 recycled metals processing facilities all over uh central and northern mexico so like it, and it just blew me away you know and who would ever ever think of of doing something like that and it just it just happened you know <laughs> and um the thing about what did you say about the present teaching what did you ask me about oh yeah um how did you find your passion for teaching because it is a bit different from you know what you did yeah. for the first seven eight years of your career yeah yeah it's very different so uh, well actually so that does have a kind of practical lesson besides dumb luck it, again it was what people were talking about uh you know um your network and and trying things out a, a friend of mine i was taking some downtime and doing some consulting a friend of mine asked me if I'd help out. Uh, he's a teacher in the South Bronx, and he's also the wrestling coach there. He wanted to me to ha help out. He had, a, he had a guy about my size that I could help out wrestling, but more than that, he wanted to do a tutoring program and get these kids some, some help. And, and so I was helping him out, and that's how I found out that I loved it, just by volunteering my time and hanging out with them. And then, and then, then I took a job to sort of test the words more and, you know, and, and so on and so forth. And, and the way I got my current role is, is again, through another wrestling contact. I just went and had lunch with, with my old uh, wrestling coach and, and he's actually the head of the phys ed department at the school. And, and I wasn't thinking of a job at all, but we just got to talking about uh, what I was doing and, oh, I'm tutoring some people and I'm really, really enjoying it. And uh, he goes, oh, we have a part-time math position. Would you like to uh, do a demo lesson? And I thought never in a million years will they hire me for this job, you know? I don't have the background. I don't have the experience, but you know, again, you got to go ask for what you want. And I went and I showed up and I said, I want this job and you should give me this job. And you know, maybe not exactly like that, a little more, uh, you know, you can, you can speak <laughs> in the right way, but, but, but essentially that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you so much. I think now we're going to move on to the Q and a section now. Hi guys. Um, first, I just want to thank everybody. Um, I don't think I've ever heard a panel with such real answers and candid um, stories. So thank you so much. Um, we do um, have one question that came in and it's, it's put to all of you. So um, if you, anyone can jump in. Um, it says, my question is, you all had to deal with a lot of negative aspects of early career development, layoffs, on unpaid internships, lower pay, because of the last economic crisis. What are you doing to lessen those difficulties for the next generation? Sure, um, I, I can get started. I mean, I think that uh, that was actually one of the reasons why I wanted to participate in this panel in the first place. Uh, I guess when the email came out, um, I, kind of jumped at the opportunity just because I've, I've given the, I've kind of told this story as part of trainings that I've delivered at Deloitte, um, just to kind of put, 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 put into perspective kind of what, what I had started in and kind of what, how quickly things can change. But uh, I would say that just uh, continuing to share this with, um, with students, with younger professionals at work, uh, that was really the, you know, how to manage and navigate through a difficult time. This really taught me a lot. And that was, and, you know, I kind of took, take the opportunity whenever I get the, the audience to try to do that. So that was, you know, thanks for inviting us to, to share this. But that was really, you know, this is one of the ways in which I try to, to try to give that story back. Yeah, I, I personally, uh, when I was uh, recently leaving a company in my exit interview, um, I told them that I felt at times during that, that tenure that they had really pushed for you know, when I was pushing for more and more responsibility, they said, no, we really want someone with 15 years experience. 
And uh, I told him it was kind of a negative view, especially in, in times like these. Um, and I talked to senior executives at that company. And I said, you have to realize that there's a class of graduates coming out. And instead of, con you know, obviously I, I couldn't really influence their, um, this other company, they were going to do a hiring freeze, which I knew about. Uh, but I told him, look, open up internship opportunities. And even recently at, at Amazon, um, on my team calls, we were talking about internship opportunities. So those are definitely things that I, I wouldn't see necessarily as negatives, right? Any, any opportunity you have to uh, build your experience and increase your marketability, um, certainly a positive. One other thing I would plug that I used uh, is uh, catchafire.org. I'm not sure if people are familiar with it, but it help, it's a non, uh, they basically help nonprofits um, find freelancers. So it's a great way to kind of give back, but also build your skill set. So um, again, I think just raising awareness, right? I, I have also, like Andrew, talked about my experience. Um, you know, at times I've heard the word millennial thrown around, like it's a kind of a negative thing. And I've told people, you know, we've been through a lot. And, and sometimes the other generation, the older generation don't realize that. So I think at least from my perspective, I will always be looking at the next generation as, you know, kind of a similar in certain ways and um i definitely would look for ways to help them uh, especially during times like these um one of the roles that i've taken on in my job also is um a lead coach for new york city teaching collaborative so i'm also helping uh career changers who are coming into teaching um through the new york city teaching fellows and uh, i'm helping them to hone their practice in fact after this um panel i have a debrief session with a, a partner teacher who um i observed earlier today to give her feedback on her teaching um so that's the way i'm trying to kind of like pay my experience forward um, and give back to people who are um, navigating the waters of a career change. I, uh, I host a, a podcast on a, a food-oriented internet radio station called Heritage Radio Network, and the whole theme of the podcast is, is career change, as people have changed careers to work in food after having done all kinds of other things. We've had uh, my co-host is a former attorney who's now a baker. I've obviously bounced around in a lot of different ways. Um, and so getting to have those conversations, first of all, and then getting to share them through the, through the Heritage Radio Network, through their, their audience, um, and hopefully get to, to draw out some of, the, some of the elements of those career changes that people have made um, and, and give other people ideas about how to do it for themselves. Because ultimately, they're, you know, like we're all saying we can talk about our experiences, we can, we can share within our networks, but ultimately, you're on your own. You're going to have to make these decisions for yourselves. You're going to have to navigate them. You're going to have to, to figure out the best course of action in a, in a less than ideal, under less than ideal circumstances. And so learn as much as you can, reach out to people you know, reach out to people who've been through similar experiences, but, but the decision is yours. And, and that's scary, but that's also very empowering. Um, so, so finding that, that balance and, and pursuing it is, is really important. Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, so we have one more question and then I think we'll wrap it up. Um, what is, and she wants to rephrase it. Okay. What is one crucial thing or trait that you have, that you have, um, you did that you think greatly impacted your ability to get a job that more people should do? Um, maybe Ethan, we'll start with you since you're on my screen. <laughs> Uh, sure. One trait. Um, you know, nobody is special, right? Like we're all uh, working through this. Um, you're going to have to find the things that work for you. The things that worked for me are not going to be the things that worked for other people. Um, I think one of the challenges with getting advice in a setting like this or really any setting is that when we're giving advice, we're really giving advice to ourselves. We're not giving advice to you because we don't know your circumstances, your situation, how you approach problems. Um, so you can you can pick and choose whatever's valuable from our stories that that you feel like applies to yourself. But um, but I wouldn't say that there's there's one trait or set of traits. It's it's really about finding your traits, finding the things that you love to do, that you're good at, that other people respect you for, and doing more of those things. 
Yeah, uh, I guess the only thing I would add in the way of a trade is that I think I've just in reading and thinking about those that are ultimately, I guess, successful. Um, I mean, I think the one of the biggest traits that uh, has come across is just being curious. And I think we've naturally, through all of our experiences, we're curious in the sense that we've had to bounce around, learn a lot of different things, ask a lot of questions, and just continuing to be curious. I mean, I've had the good fortune of you know having some job security throughout throughout my you know, through my career, but get Deloitte being a really, really big place. I got, you know, if I had a question on anything, just being able to ask people about certain things, how do they do certain things? And as again, this group mentioned, and I think you'll all find, especially as college students, I mean, I think the doors are always open to you. I would say at Deloitte, you know, our interns generally sit right above our partners. An intern asks any questions, they're probably going to get a, you know, they're going to get a response. So you guys are in a really unique position to ask a lot of great questions. So just continue to be curious and that'll really take you far because you never know you know, asking a question, there might be something that piques your interest. And I think this group here has kind of talked to that a bunch. Um, you never know where that, might, where that might take you. It might take you down a rabbit hole you never thought you were going to go down. Just continue to be curious and you, you never know where that's going to take you. So um, I think besides uh, flexibility, which is a point that's been reiterated over and over again, um, because it is so important. Um, to being successful, I think you also have to be really honest with yourself about not only what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are, but also like what you can see yourself doing and being passionate about. So just like being really honest with yourself about um, what are realistic goals for you if you have to change your goals. Um. <laughs> I would, people already talked about it, but it, it can't be emphasized enough. But number one is, it's like ask questions and ask for help. You know, I can't in, in everything that I've done, you know, I've, I've always, that's one thing for whatever reason, I don't know. I'm, I'm not really a humble person. And like I told you guys when I was younger, especially I was more worried about what people thought of me, but for whatever reason, I don't know why I got it in my head that you, you can't ask questions and like, it's okay not to know something. Like that is not, smart people ask questions. It just means that you don't know a certain set of facts. And my experience has been that if you do that, um, people, people will bend over backwards to help you. I had traders taking me in, in conference rooms and, and explaining what cop, copper arbitrage is, like, you know, buying the London Metal Exchange and selling on the, the COMEX exchange and, and how it works and how you make money off it. And, uh, you know, and, and I had, uh, just as a teacher, I cannot tell you, you know, how the other teachers have bent over backwards to, to help me and teach me and come to my class and, and watch it and give me constructive criticism. And, uh, there are people out there and, and they do want to help you because everybody has been there where they're at the, they're at the bottom of the ladder or they're, they're the one who's, you know, in the out position, you know, so it's, it's a human universal. Great. Um, actually, just going to ask one more question, and I'm going to direct this th to Ethan because he did. Um, he spoke about this, and I think, especially for our Macaulay students on the line, um, from what I've gathered, um, what I, I've witnessed over the years, our, you're all so smart, and you, and you work so hard. And um, Ethan, you said something about not taking this kind of time periods um, personally, and like you, you said you were laid off. And can you just maybe? emphasize a little bit um, a moment where, you know, I think a lot of um, honors students, they're used to, you know, getting the answer right and, 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 every, and getting what they worked for. And, and maybe you could just, we can end on you uh, talking a little bit about when, you know, maybe you got laid off or, or whatever and what, what you honed in on that got you through it. And then we'll end. Yeah. Um, I think so some of it is that there are no more right and wrong answers in, in your lives. Uh, school is different from a professional career. Um, you will have relationships with bosses that will be comparable or similar to relationships that you have with teachers or professors, but, but are fundamentally different because you can leave. You can walk out of the room if you want to. Um, the, 
I mean, like I said, I've been laid off a lot, uh, which is a, a, an experience that a lot of uh, people who graduated in 2008, 2009 share. Um, I guess, I guess my, my, the piece of advice I would leave you with is to embrace every experience, get what you can from that experience, learn what you can from the people around you. Um, we, we have the privilege of, of living in New York City, of being surrounded by some of the smartest, most knowledgeable people in the world on any subject you can possibly imagine. And so whatever it is you're interested in, get close to the people who are good at doing that thing, who know a lot about that thing. Um, and then, you know, the ups and downs of a career, they're gonna happen to everybody. You will roll with them. You will use the tools at your disposal internally and externally to, to make the most of those shifts. But, um, but spend time in every experience uh, so, that, so that you come out of it as a better person, knowing more about a subject that you care about, building stronger networks with other people who also care about that subject. And then if the relationship or the, the, the job or whatever it is, if it lasts a month, amazing. If it lasts 10 years, even better. But you know, I had, I had this ice cream company. So I, I was working at a restaurant um, on the Lower East Side called Allen and Delancey. Uh, I had been promoted to pastry chef two weeks before the restaurant went bankrupt, shut down overnight with no notice. It turned out later that the owner had been funneling money out of the business and it's a whole long, actually not uncommon story in, in New York City restaurants, but that's the way it happened. So I just gotten this promotion. I was super excited. Uh, and then the restaurant was, was gone overnight. They, okay, they called we... us one morning and said, uh, come in and get your stuff. We're done. Um, but I'd been making a lot of ice cream there. Uh, I, I had this idea that I could start an ice cream cart. Um, so I, I found a cart. I found a, a friend of a friend who, who was willing for whatever reason to be my business partner, who is still, who is my current business partner on my current business and has been one of my best friends for 10 years. Um, and we had an ice cream cart and it lasted for four months, maybe not even four months, three months. We didn't pay ourselves. We donated hundred percent of the profits. Uh, it was in the scheme, in the time frame of my life, a blip. It was a, it was three months, one summer. But, but the way that that experience has has changed everything I've done, and the way that I look back on that experience, the way I talk about that experience to other people, the way I'm telling you that story right now, um, the 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 value, the impact of that experience went way beyond the time that I spent in it. Um, and so that would be the the piece of advice that I leave you with is to is to go as deep as you can into every experience that you have build as strong a network as you can at every point in your career and and whatever happens in the meantime you'll be fine okay thank you so much to everyone um i think um all panelists i'm sure will be okay if we share your email with students if they have follow-up questions um but thank you again um again a, a, a plug for all the students out there, your alumni relations office, your career services office, we're here to serve you. So please uh, use our resources. And again, each and every one of these panelists, you were amazing. You were so honest and candid and um, we're so appreciative. And Samantha, great job. Everybody, um, take care. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks. Have a great day, everyone.